thank you very much for inviting me to this very important occasion of ULI Asia Pacific. Um, ho hosting for a second time uh, this very interesting and exciting uh, summit in Hong Kong, especially at a time when you are celebrating your 10th anniversary. Uh, I still remember when uh, Nick um, sent an invitation, he started by saying that, okay, this summit is a long way away <laughs> because the invitation was actually sent to me last September. Uh, okay, it was about a couple of months after I took uh, office as the chief executive for Hong Kong. But now I, here I am, so I have this uh, impression that uh, uh, time really flies for me as the chief executive for Hong Kong. I'll be uh, celebrating my first anniversary very soon. There is a Chinese saying that when people are in a state of uh, anxiety, very unhappy, then uh, days pass like years. So I take it that I have a pretty enjoyable and relaxing tenure as a chief executive when months actually pass like days. Okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about, I think people in um, the uh, real estate sector uh, are very used to hearing me talk with a uh, beautiful PowerPoint <laughs> going into tens and tens of slides about Hong Kong's land development, transport infrastructure. But I have no PowerPoint for you uh, this morning because uh, I was invited to talk about how I lead this top tier city. There is another Chinese saying that uh, is um, easier actually to start a business, but it's extremely difficult to sustain a successful business. Uh, so I'm now right in this position of uh, sustaining this top tier city and bringing this top tier city to newer heights. So I only have a few words I want to share with you in this leadership position. Uh, that is what it's like to lead this uh, top tier city. One is it is extremely tiring. Secondly, it is extremely challenging, but fortunately, it's extremely fulfilling. Now, uh, just to impress upon you uh, on the workload or the work pressure on the chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, since I won the election on the 26th of March last year, which by now is almost one and a half years, I have taken only one day's leave uh, to spend a very brief holiday with my family in a city called Guiling in the Guangxi Autonomous Region. And that was really a brief holiday of four nights. But even during that very brief holiday, I had to produce a video on how wonderful it is to travel on the high-speed rail. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, Sunzhen North Station, uh, three hours to Guiling, and uh, sort of uh, promoting the high-speed rail in Hong Kong, which will open by the end of September this year, and by which time I don't need to go to Sunzhen North to change uh, into a high-speed train. I will walk into the uh, West Kowloon Terminus, and then one stop, although we will stop on the on route, but uh, I don't need to train, change any train, and I'll be in Guiling in about three hours' time. And I also, during that very brief holiday, had uh, meetings with the leaders of Guangxi uh, who wanted to talk to me about this uh, exciting project of the Southern Corridor. And then I was invited to inspect some poverty elevation work in a village in, uh, uh, in Guiling, how they revitalize a village in order to help raise the standard of living uh, in some of these uh, rural villages. So I come to the conclusion that uh, in this particular position, there is simply no private life for the chief executive, and I just don't have any personal time for myself and my family. Uh, that is because about 20% of my time uh, was actually spent outside of Hong Kong in the last year or so. I have made 21 trips out of Hong Kong to promote this top tier city. And uh, next Wednesday, Wednesday, I'm embarking on a grand European tour of uh, 13 days covering three countries and six cities in continental Europe to continue to promote Hong Kong and to explore opportunities for collaboration uh, with Hong Kong 
in a wide range of areas, uh, including uh, innovation and technology, arts and culture, uh, business, financial services, uh, RMB trading, and so on and so on. Because we are a cosmopolitan city, very proud of being an international financial center, shipping and logistics, and now emerging as a very important arts and cultural hub. I hope to, uh, friends who come abroad will have some time to visit the recently opened Central Police Station compound, now called Dai Gun, which is uh, revitalized into an arts and entertainment precinct for Hong Kong people as well as for tourists. Now, um, I also promised and have um, delivered this pledge to work more closely with our politicians, the Legislative Council, because in our political system, and that is uh, why leadership is so important, if we want to deliver for Hong Kong, I have to work with the politicians across the spectrum, whether they are pro-government, anti-establishment, or even very radical uh, members in the Legislative Council. So from January this year, I started this practice of going more frequently uh, to the Legislative Council to attend not only the long versions of question and answers uh, by the chief executive every quarter, but also in addition to go there at least once a month to, to be questioned, to be uh, grilled and drilled and, and whatever. But uh, these interactions have been proven to be quite uh, rewarding and effective. So for those in the audience who are in the construction industry, you'll be pleased to hear that I am expecting a very uh, mm -hmm. a good year in terms of getting funding for Hong Kong's infrastructure. I have said in public that I'm expecting uh, total uh, funding to be approved this year by the Legislative Council will be in the region of 170 billion Hong Kong dollars, which is the highest level in the last uh, five years. So this is so much about <laughs> this being a very tiring job because of all the things I need to do and the people I need to engage in order to continue to lead Hong Kong effectively. I said this job is also extremely challenging because on the one hand, uh, Hong Kong has her unique strengths, which I still feel there is a huge potential to be tapped. And that's why I do a lot of all these uh, overseas and mainland trips. Um, the other, on the other hand, we are facing a lot of uh, difficulties. So that is what makes this job extremely challenging and also interesting. But let me just start by uh, sharing a bit with you. The major challenge lies in the constitutional position of the chief executive. Many of you will know that I have been the government's number two uh, for four and a half years before I resigned to contest in the chief executive election. So you will feel that perhaps it's not too uh, different and difficult because it's number two moving into number one position. But constitutionally, as laid down in the basic law, the position of the chief executive is unique. He or she is responsible to both the people of Hong Kong as well as the central people's government or what we call this dual accountability. So to ensure the continued success of one country, two systems, the chief executive has to perform his or her role well in um, taking into account the interests of the central people's government as well as the people of Hong Kong. I would say with my year's experience, at most of the time, the two sets of interests align very well because you have heard our leaders uh, saying that they want Hong Kong to succeed. They want Hong Kong to continue to be an international city, a financial center. And more recently, in the 19th report of President Xi Jinping, he said that uh, he would support Hong Kong to integrate herself into the national development. So there are plenty of opportunities for us to tap, uh, provided that uh, the chief executive performs well in discharging her due responsibility. The second challenge lies in our political system. Um, Tom has been a politician, and many of you know that in many of the overseas uh, parliaments, the ruling government will be having a majority in the parliament so that uh, the government could push uh, the policies through the legislative council or the parliament. But in our case, our, we, our situation is unique in a sense that uh, the government does not even have a single vote in the Legislative Council. 
uh, okay, uh, with amongst the um, electrical members, we could say that some political parties are more pro-establishment, uh, others are maybe uh, less pro-establishment, but their vested interests differ significantly. So it is not always uh, reliable to think that I have always the support of the allies from the pro-establishment group. It really depends on the issues of the day that we need to uh, uh, press ahead in order to deliver for the people of Hong Kong. The third challenge lies in, there have been a quite a bit of misunderstanding or prejudiced uh, comments about where Hong Kong is under one country, two systems. So especially for overseas friends, I would encourage you to really look deeper into Hong Kong situation and read more broadly about uh, different commentaries about Hong Kong instead of just taking on face value that oh, this high degree of autonomy has been eroded, the one country, two system concept is not being uh, upheld and, and so on. But of course it uh, lies on the shoulders of the chief executive to continue to dispel those uh, misperceptions and misunderstanding. Now Hong Kong is facing a lot of challenges. If we want to continue to be a top tier city and even further and better to rise to new height. We need to enhance our competitiveness because we are living in a globalized economic environment. So uh, we cannot sit back and relax and think that we will succeed by being the freest economy in the world and one of the most competitive economies in the world because the world is changing. And other people, other governments, other economies are moving ahead. So uh, the, um, we need to seize the many opportunities uh, available to us under the Belt and Road and this uh, Guangdong, Hong Kong Bay Area. I'm not going into detail in these two major national strategies and what they have in offer for Hong Kong because I have looked at your program. I believe that uh, some of the subsequent panel discussions will cover these two uh, very important areas. And then we have an issue of public aspirations. Um, for many advanced economies all over the world, the people are now more assertive. They, they really want the government to do more for them. They are unhappy about um, the gaps in the, the wealth. They are unhappy about not being able to buy a flat. Uh, young people are a bit aggrieved about the lack of opportunities in uh, upward mobility and so on. So the challenge lies in how I could effectively um, respond to the rising public aspirations across the spectrum of uh, the economy, job opportunities, uh, social inclusion, equality, and so on. Now, nothing is more pressing in Hong Kong and more not, nothing is more challenging in Hong Kong than this single issue of land supply, which ULI may come to our rescue and, and give us another advisory panel on how we can find the land. Right now, uh, knowing very well that uh, this is a very controversial issue, and uh, I've said in public that Hong Kong maybe is not short of land because only 24% of our 1,100 square kilometers have been developed, so there are still three quarters of land to be tapped and we are surrounded by water. But there is a lack of uh, consensus on where we should find this land for meeting our economic, social, and housing needs. So right now, there is a, a land supply task force uh, undertaking a public engagement, uh, hopefully to build a broad consensus before we could uh, move forward. But uh, also on land, I have something very um, interesting and exciting to report, especially with Tom Murphy here, because he has uh, helped me upon my invitation and uh, did one of those uh, international advisory panels in 2011 on the development of Kai Tech and East Kowloon. Because uh, uh, when I was uh, Secretary for Development, I did realize that we are not only short of land for housing, we're also short of land for business. Uh, especially if we want to be an um, international business hub, then we need to provide land or housing, uh, land and offices, especially grade A offices for some of these uh, overseas and mainland businesses to set up. And I have targeted uh, Kowloon East as the um, uh, second central business district. So in 2011, I announced a major initiative called Energizing 
colonies, that is to transform colonies comprising the two former industrial areas of Kun Tong and Kowloon Bay, and this new sort of recycled site of the former airport of Kai Tak into a second CBD. I said I was exciting to report because, uh, Tom, you'll be pleased to hear that within a few years, um, this second CBD is emerging. We are expecting the, um, uh, the colonies to produce about 3 million square meters of office space by the year 2021. We are gradually building up. And then uh, with the potential to reach 5 million uh, square meters of office space upon completion of the various uh, new developments, redevelopments, and conversion of uh, industrial buildings. Um, looking ahead, uh, if you ask me, where could I find a similar area for that sort of exciting development, it has to be Lantau. Because upon completion of the bridge connecting Hong Kong through the Lantau uh, area to Macau and Zhuhai, and the completion of the second link into Lantau Island, that is the Tuen Mun Chak Lap Gok Ling by 2020, Lantau is no longer an isolated island. Lantau is very well connected uh, and very well positioned in the Guangdong, Macau, Hong Kong Bay Area. So um, I, together with my team, uh, are now looking into the further potential of Lantau. Inevitably, it will involve uh, some extensive reclamation because uh, people are very attached to country parks and Lantau has two country parks on the south and on the north. And also the southern part of Lantau is simply beautiful with Tai O, Cheung Sa and all these areas. And I don't think we should forego uh, the opportunities to conserve this very beautiful part of the Lantau Island. Now my third um, um, uh, feeling is uh, this job is extremely fulfilling because I was born and brought up in Hong Kong and I love this city. So uh, where else could I find a job that I could sort of uh, serve the people and serve the people I, I love than in the position of the chief executive? Because as a chief executive, I can make decisions. I can make very timely decisions in order to progress Hong Kong ahead. And the, um, the uh, very rewarding experience I have in the last year is once the government get its act together, a very clear vision, uh, clear direction, put in a bit of resources, the response is overwhelming. This is what I have seen in innovation and technology. Uh, Nick Brock uh, was a former chairman of the Hong Kong uh, Science and Technology Corporation, uh, laying very good groundwork for uh, innovation and technology development in Hong Kong. But the pace of innovation and technology in the last 11 months or so uh, I have to say is amazing. Uh, so we have an um, uh, egg-prone strategy laid out to really develop Hong Kong's innovation and technology, not only to diversify our economy, but also to provide more quality jobs uh, for our young people. Uh, on the financial side, you will feel that perhaps Hong Kong is already a very mature financial center. We don't need to do any more things uh, proactively, no. We have introduced a few things uh, in the last uh, uh, several months uh, in Hong Kong to take our financial center to new height. One is uh, more aggressive uh, policy measures to encourage the issue of bonds, especially green bonds in Hong Kong. Secondly is to uh, provide tax incentives for aircraft leasing activities to take place in Hong Kong. Third is uh, the Hong Kong Exchange has introduced new listing rules um, by the end of uh, April uh, that will uh, attract uh, or facilitate the listing of new economy technology companies as well as bio uh, technology companies in Hong Kong and provide a more ready platform for secondary listing for some of these tech companies that have been listed uh, elsewhere. So uh, with this uh, very tiring, very challenging and very fulfilling uh, job, uh, I am now very confident and very determined that I will do this job well uh, because I believe the best of Hong Kong is yet to come. And this is where I will stop and show you a three-minute video on why I feel the best of Hong Kong is yet to come. Thank you very much.
was a mayor of a city, how intimidating is this, of, of us in a city of 300,000 people in a region of two and a half million, and I get to talk to the chief executive about what it means to be a, a, the leader of a city. So what wakes you up, what keeps you up at night? Nothing, because I, if you I'm so that, tired, if you watch, if you, I just don't, <laughs> I don't wake up at night. So what, what is, what do you, what do you see, I mean, yeah. that, that video, yeah. if you watched it every morning, it just energizes you, it's spectacular, and, yeah. and John commented, you know, you would have never seen something like that yeah. just a few years ago in, about Hong Kong. It's just a wonderful way to project yourself. No, uh, actually, uh, my predecessors and many, many men and women have laid very strong foundations for Hong Kong. But uh, Hong Kong does need a little bit of re-energizing and rebranding uh, in order to uh, uh, reach new heights. Yeah. But uh, worries, yes. One is, of course, land. As I said, the most pressing issue is really land. Because without land, I could not respond to uh, the number one livelihood issue, that is housing. Without land, I could not sort of entertain a lot of positive responses and requests to come in to work with us, whether in science technology, setting up another uh, international school, and uh, building a private hospital in Hong Kong, and so on. And that is where the Bay Area may come in, because with the opening of this major infrastructure, uh, and connectivity will be enhanced. Uh, we are talking about a one hour uh, living zone. Uh, right. So uh, that may provide a bit of uh, sort of uh, capacity. That, that, that is a great ULI panel opportunity, isn't it? Um, so the, the issue of land, though, um, very contentious about where, where you find the land, whether you create the land, uh, but it's a variety of uses you're talking about also, not just for housing, but for commercial opportunities and recreation. So it's a mix of all kind of uses you're looking at. Uh, and what, what are some of your thoughts about how do you, how do, you, how do, you do that? Uh, what, do you, what, what are the tensions that you're balancing? Let me just say that you know, whether you're a city of eight million or a city of a couple million, we're, we've all facing the same kind of challenges of how do you get those developments well, to happen. Well, with, with the media watching, <laughs> And uh, task force doing is public engagement. I cannot be very categorical right. in answering uh, your question. Otherwise, I'll be accused of preempting <laughs> uh, a public uh, process. Uh, but what I am appealing to the people of Hong Kong and to the political uh, groups and uh, concerned uh, organizations is don't say no. Try to say yes, right. because every day there will be uh, reports about survey. There is one coming out this morning saying that over 50% of the respondents uh, did not want us to touch the country parks. And then uh, yesterday you could have another survey report that uh, we don't want any reclamation because we want to protect the marine ecology. And then a third day, you can have a group who love farming. They say, don't touch my farmland. I want to farm in Hong Kong. So we are, we, are, we, are, we are stuck if everybody takes that sort of attitude. So I, I'm just appealing uh, to uh, people of Hong Kong that we need to take Hong Kong's uh, interest, um, immediate interest and even longer term interest uh, into account in discussing uh, these issues and hopefully to uh, come up with a broad consensus on where land should come from. So what I have found always in, in seeing other leaders, people want bold leadership until they disagree. Uh, uh, and then um, they don't like bold leadership. They want consensus or compromise. Or, and so how are you separating? I mean, you're a bold leader. Uh, that, so, but, but you also need to build the kind of consensus you're talking about to get to a place. And so how do you measure between those two? What are the challenges you're facing? Well, I agree with you because, uh, uh, Tom, you have been in the public service and know all these intricacies of right. uh, um, working with the people and leader should not be very arrogant and should be humble and so on. So uh, during my election campaign, I, I, I put out three messages. I said that if I were elected a chief executive, I want to uh, portray or uh, adopt a new style of governance. So uh, under this heading of a new style of governance, it does mean that I need to interact more with people. 
starting with the political people. Right. And uh, we need to be more transparent. We need to share the information and data we have. So hopefully that will provide a good basis for some rational discussion. So uh, that, is, um, that has been my guiding principle, not only as the chief executive, but for, you, for those who have worked with me, when I was secretary of development, whether it's the harbor front uh, enhancement or with Maggie on the heritage conservation, this style of trying to work with the people and help people to understand uh, our position and hopefully uh, come to a, um, uh, a joint view on where things should move is, is what I have been adopting. In my experience is that that does take, it's very time consuming to do that because you, there's lots of meetings and there's lots of discussion. Are you, are you seeing some movement in terms of people's positions about not being just against something but trying to figure out a solution for the challenges? Well, many people uh, told me that in the last year or so, Hong Kong has become calmer. Is that your impression? <laughs> and people are more willing to, uh, to talk to get things done, and I've given you a very good indicator that uh, when we were very un we were very upset with this, this call filibustering in the Legislative Council, uh, stalling our proposals, at least in getting funding for public works projects, we are moving ahead uh, quite uh, effectively. But while I'm saying this, in uh, one and a half hours' time, some form of filibustering will take place <laughs> in the Legislative Council because we have a very piece of contentious legislation that will go through Legislative Council in order to implement the co-location arrangement in the West Kowloon terminus of the high-speed train. Hmm. So we, in this conference that we're having, there's been a lot of discussion about the One Belt Road and Road program. And, and the potential opportunities are going to be created in the Bay Area. What's your impressions of that? And is it, are you beginning to see some actual impact? Well, we have been working uh, very proactively in both areas. But uh, as I said, I thought you would have other speakers and panelists. So I, I spare my lengthy uh, explanation on what the Hong Kong as our government is doing. The Belt and Road Initiative actually aligns very well with uh, my government strategy, and that is we should make the full use of the high degree of autonomy in conducting Hong Kong's external affairs in order to build up more uh, links, business opportunities with um, overseas economies. Because uh, to be very honest, in the past decades or so, um, we, our businesses and our professionals have uh, put in a lot of attention in the mainland, quite rightly so, because of the uh, rapidly opening up and reform in the, um, the mainland economy that gave us a lot of opportunities. But I think since Hong Kong is an international city, in order to maintain as a top tier international city, we also need to have those global links. So uh, that fits in very well with the Belt and Road. Uh, because the Belt and Road now um, covers 70 plus countries especially amongst the ASEAN region along the Belt and Road. Because the 10 member nations of uh, the ASEAN community are all Belt and Road countries. And uh, we have signed a free trade agreement with the ASEAN community last November. Uh, that will come into effect uh, early next year and will give us um, uh, more, more better access uh, into those markets and also with a related investment agreement. So uh, the Belt and Road uh, aligns well with uh, our strategy and provides more opportunities for our businesses, professional services, and investors. The uh, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau Bay area is even more practical. It actually can help to address some of the, what I call bottlenecks in Hong Kong's further economic progress. One is land, the other is labor. <laughs> and also opening up a market of uh, um, 68 million people, uh, now already very affluent, but will continue to be very affluent uh, in terms of consumption. Because uh, when people move up the social ladder, they need, to, uh, they need to spend, they need to have access to quality medical services and quality education services and so on. Then those are the areas that Hong Kong is very good at. So uh, I have agreed with the uh, Guangdong governor before this development plan is even promulgated that we will focus on three areas. One is to facilitate the free flow of people, capital, goods, information within the um, Bay Area region. 
Secondly, is to um, develop in the Bay Area mainland city some of the services which Hong Kong is very good at, so education, medical. Third is to jointly develop an international innovation and technology hub uh, in the Bay Area, not solely in Hong Kong, very much like the Silicon Valley. But I feel we are even better positioned than other Bay Areas because um, in terms of innovation and technology, we have very good research and development capacity in Hong Kong. As you can see from the video, five of our universities are amongst the top 100. Uh, we have very good uh, researchers in biotechnology and also now seeing in AI and robotics. And then we, when we do translational research, we need manufacturing. But as you know, Tom, we don't have any more manufacturing in Hong Kong. Right. But the Bay Area has. Whether it's Shenzhen, Dongguan, Foshan, they all have advanced manufacturing capacity. So uh, this, um, these two uh, streams uh, complement each other and will give us uh, a lot of uh, prospects. And furthermore, uh, about three weeks ago, we have a very uh, major breakthrough uh, under the personal guidance and support of President Xi Jinping is uh, our local uh, research institutions and universities are now eligible to apply for state funding uh, for innovation and technology. And the funding received uh, could be spent solely in Hong Kong. It would be actually, previously, it's very difficult to get the research. Funding. And this is for research dollars. For research. Yeah. So it's for interesting research. because uh, China is the second largest investor in research annually, year after year, in the world right now, uh, the United States being number one. And that is really the, the driver of technology. And I, I had the opportunity to be with Nick uh, when he was chairman of the science and technology. He asked me to speak there a, a number of years ago. And, and, and it has been really striking how the, your technology economy is beginning to grow. And, and I, think pe I think people don't understand the impact that can have on Hong Kong in terms of the, the employment and, uh, and, and the value. Let me just add that we are not solely relying on state funding for research. I have set a target, uh, which is pretty ambitious target, is at the moment Hong Kong as a whole only spent 0.73% uh, of the GDP on R&D, public and private right. taken together. I have uh, promised in my policy address last October to push this figure or to double this figure to 1.5% within my term of <laughs> five years. Then after I announced it, my colleague said that it's very difficult, CE, to achieve that. You know, it's 45, 1.5% means 45 billion research dollars uh, every year. So our strategy is now the government will spend more. We'll put in more R&D funding right. in the universities. We have now a legislative proposal uh, underway is to uh, give tax incentive for corporations to spend R&D by giving them super deductions. Uh, simply Put simply, if you spend $100, we'll give you $200 or even $300 profits tax deduction. And we are attracting some uh, very tax salvy companies to set up in Hong Kong so that they will bring the technology and the research development funding and will be counted as our R&D uh, funding. But uh, talking about money, uh, Hong Kong is extremely fortunate. We have very strong public finances. Uh, we have a record surplus uh, last year, close to $150 billion in a single year. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And uh, now sitting on a reserve of a uh, trillion, that, that, that sort of scale. So uh, as a chief executive, I, I'm in a very fortunate position to be able to spend a bit more in order to uh, improve people's livelihood and also to uh, um, give some uh, driving force to the economy. So, I mean, what we, what we have seen uh, and what we're seeing all over the world is what is driving economies of city now is their ability to attract talent either to grow the talent or to attract it. And, and Hong Kong does both very well. And I, are, are you focused on continuing to build the kind of vibrancy that, and keep it the vibrancy? The panel that you heard about in Beijing, uh, for example, was uh, really the, in central Beijing focusing on historic preservation to, to maintain the authenticity of an area. And, and are you, do you have some thoughts about how, how you're doing that in a very intentional way in Hong Kong? Well, uh, conservation has always been very close uh, to my heart. Uh, in fact, I am, 
I'm proud to be associated with many heritage conservation projects in Hong Kong. And I do uh, share many of the uh, sentiments expressed by the conservation groups that uh, if you want to be a world-class city, you do need to have that sort of uh, history in okay. a city. It's not just a transplanting a modern smart city and then you are international city. So uh, balancing uh, conservation and development will continue to be our uh, development strategy. So I mentioned about Lentau. Lentau is less of a historical type of conservation, but very strong on nature conservation. So we will not lose sight of the need for um, conservation. Good for you. So I am really struck by the strategy and the vision you've laid out. And is it, is it written down? Is it in your head? Huh? <laughs> Because it's really an, an important co uh, piece of that, how you communicate that vision. As I, I know as a mayor, when we were trying to change our city, that was a big challenge. How do you communicate that vision so people see a place for themselves? They're willing to, to change if they see that the change could benefit them. And I think that's the challenge of leadership today. Well, that is also in the case of Hong Kong, that how to uh, disseminate the messages and how to articulate the vision so that uh, we can have a, a strong community support to take some of the tough decisions that we have to take. Um, I, I don't have time to write down anything now, <laughs> but I'll do so when Somebody I come, ought to. come to the end of my term. I, I'm supposed to bring you a book, uh, Tom, uh, because uh, at the end of my tenure, a five-year tenure as Secretary for Development, we did produce a publication, which I feel is one of the best government publications about uh, how in a mere five year period we have ambition and develop Hong Kong. Nick has a copy, right? You have a copy. Now, so that, copy. that, but that's true. What I found in leading a city was that if people saw where, where you were trying to go, they were more willing to compromise and they were more willing to, to work to, to make it happen. It's just so often people don't see a place for themselves so they get threatened by the change. And that's what we're talking about. You're laying out a very dynamic program of change for Hong Kong. So congratulations and we're getting the hook here. Thank you so much for joining us at ULI.